Before getting into ultrasound imaging of the lateral aspect of the elbow, I want to do a quick review of its anatomy. We all know how to palpate the bony crest, which is the lateral epicondyle, where the various structures featured in this video will insert. It is also important to find the bony ridge that travels along the lateral aspect of the lower third of the humerus. This is a lateral supracondylar ridge, which terminates as a crest on the epicondyle. The humeroradial joint consists of the capitellum and radio head. This joint is covered by a radial collateral ligament made up of three bundles. The humeroradial ligament, spanning the lateral epicondyle and the radial head, the annular ligament, wrapping around the radial head, and the humeroulnar ligament between the lateral epicondyle and the lateral side of the ulna. As for the tendons, only the extensor carpus ulnaris tendon inserts behind the lateral epicondyle. In front, the supinator tendon's insertion is more superficial than the lateral collateral ligament, and even more superficial is the tendon of the extensor digitorum and the tendon of the extensor digiti minimi. Lastly, the two radial-sided extensor muscles insert in front on the supracondylar ridge. First, the extensor carpe radialis brevis, distally, and then, more proximally, the extensor carpi radialis longus, which is unique in that it is solely muscle and bone. The next important structure is the radial nerve, which tracks along the anterolateral aspect of the elbow, superficial to the brachialis muscle and deep to the brachioradialis muscle. At the elbow, it divides into a superficial sensory branch and a deep motor branch, which runs between the two heads of the supinator muscle at the level of the arcade of Froes. It then shifts to the posterior side of the forearm, where it becomes the posterior interosseous nerve. In the vast majority of cases, ultrasound of the lateral aspect of the elbow is used to look for lesions in the epicondylar tendons, but it's also an opportunity to support a differential diagnosis involving a joint or a nerve. So, I'd like to start this exploration by looking for joint pathologies. The exploration starts with the elbow extended in supination. We start with a sagittal section of the anteros lateral aspect of the elbow, which allows us to easily locate the radial head. Look for a joint effusion here around the radial head, or at the anterior articular recess in front of the distal humerus. Also look for synovial thickening, which is suggestive of a rheumatic disease or a loose body. In the context of trauma, Haymar arthrosis could be evidence of an occult fracture, especially of the radial head, which can be detected by ultrasound imaging as a break in the cortex. Lastly, this sagittal section makes it easy to locate the synovial fold of the humeroradial joint, which is this small, well-defined, hyperechogenic triangle that is two to three millimeters thick within the humeroradial joint space. Some authors believe this fold is the cause of some cases of lateral epicondylitis, although this is controversial. Thus, one must be careful when suggesting this diagnosis. We can mention seeing a thicker hyperechoic inflammatory synovial fold when it can be confirmed by comparing it with the other elbow. After a joint lesion is ruled out, the next step should be to look for nerve injury, in particular radial tunnel syndrome. The examination is always carried out with the patient's elbow extended, forearm supinated and relaxed on the exam table. An axial section is taken on the anterolateral aspect of the elbow, which makes it easy to locate the radial nerve. It is superficial to the brachialis muscle and deep to the brachioradialis muscle. Using the elevator technique, the radial nerve can be followed over its entire course until it splits into two. A superficial sensory branch here and a deep motor branch which passes between the two heads of the supinator muscle, the superficial head here and the deep head here, to end up on the posterior side of the forearm where it becomes the posterior interosseous nerve. 
At the supinator muscle, we position the probe and then turn it 90 degrees, showing a sagittal section of the sensory branch of the radial nerve. We have a good view here of it passing under the superficial head of the supinator muscle at the arcade of Froze. Epicondylagia, in the context of a radial tunnel syndrome at the elbow, is typically located a few centimeters below where a lateral epicondylitis would be. Some authors contend that epicondylagia is actually a combination of three different entities. Tendon epicondylitis, the humeroidal synovial fold, and this radial tunnel syndrome at the elbow. A radial tunnel syndrome at the elbow is likely when we can see that the motor branch of the radial nerve is deformed under the arcade of froze and the nerve is thicker above it. A threshold of 2 mm is typically used, but a comparison with the contralateral elbow will prove decisive. Triggering pain when the probe passes over this arcade is another good sign. Having the patients do forceful supination and pronation movements can also enhance the ultrasound signs. We might also be asked to carry out a nerve block at the arcade of Froze by inserting a needle between the two heads of the supinator muscle. Corticosteroid injections are another possibility, but the results have been inconclusive. Another possibility is a schwannoma of the radial nerve. We can also look for extrinsic compression due to homoradial synovial cyst. We have finally arrived at what interests us the most in the context of ultrasound of the lateral aspect of the elbow, namely the epicondylar tendons. The exploration is done by placing the patient's arm in pronation with the palm of the hand against the table, forearm completely relaxed. We take a longitudinal section along the axis of the forearm. This section reveals the conjoined tendon of the lateral epicondylar muscles. We can sweep up and down, looking for disorganized architecture, partial detachment, ossification, or cortical irregularities. This position has the advantage of leaving the epicondylar tendons completely relaxed. We can now look for an intratendinous fissure or hyperemia on intratendinous Doppler, which is the best way to differentiate active tendinopathy. Looking for typical signs such as tendon thickening or hypercogenic signals is less discriminating given that these are quite often found in the asymptomatic general population. It may be necessary to define exactly which tendon is the problem. In this position, the epicondylar tendons are wrapped around each other, making it difficult to individualize them. So we continue the exploration by supinating the forearm while gently pressing the 90-degree flexed elbow against the abdomen. We can also ask the patient to place both fists together. This results in a very symmetric position and sets the stage for a good comparative exam. Finally, we can ask the patient to make a fist and relax it to force the epicondylar muscles to contract, which makes it easier for us to locate them. To identify the various epicondylar tendons, we start with a longitudinal section along the forearm axis and set the probe proximally. Here we can see the insertion of the extensor carpi radialis longus, which is unique in that it doesn't have a true tendon, only muscle and bone. If we move down a few millimeters, we can see a relatively thin tendon, depending on the size of the patient, which is the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon. A very typical feature is seen here, an important V-shaped landmark between the extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon superficially and the extensor digitorum communis tendon deeply, with these two branches being separated by the muscle belly of the extensor digitorum communis. A little lower, and right behind the extensor digitorum communis, you will find the extensor digiti minimi, and deeper, the supinator tendon, which covers the humeroradial joint space. Even deeper, we can play with the anisotropy and reveal the humeroradial ligament. The next step of the exam is to make axial sections 
by turning the probe 90 degrees, which will uncover the epicondyla ridge here. Behind the ridge, we find the fibers of the extensor carpi ulnaris tendon. In front of it, to individualize the tendons, I suggest that you go down a few centimeters along the forearm and locate another very simple landmark, which is the extensor digitorum communis muscle. It has a very distinctive muscle belly shape, which is well developed superficially to its tendon and deep here at the tip of the arrow. By analogy, we can imagine this muscle is shaped like a hot air balloon, with a relatively large balloon above a smaller basket. It is important to locate this extensor digitorum communis muscle at the level of the forearm, as the extensor carpi radialis brevis can be found immediately in front of it. The extensor carpi ulnaris behind it and the supinator muscle in the deep layer. If we move down a few more centimeters, we can see a small muscle belly on the posterior side of the extensor digitorum communis, which is the muscle belly of the extensor digit minimi. Now that each muscle is clearly visible, it is easier to move back up towards the lateral epicondyle to determine which tendon structure is damaged. To recap, on a longitudinal section, we find the most proximal insertion of the extensor carpi radialis longus muscle, which has no true tendon, then a V-shape between the extensor carpi radialis brevis and the extensor digitorum communis with the supinator muscle and lateral collateral ligament in the deep layer. On an axial section, in the forearm, we can see the hot air balloon shape of the extensor digitorum communis, Behind it, the comma-shaped muscle belly of the extensor digit minimi, and in front, the extensor carpi radialis brevis. And remember that behind the epicondylar ridge, there is nothing but the fibers of the extensor carpi ulnaris. The final step is to look for lesions of the radial collateral ligament of the elbow. Earlier, we saw that it was made up of three bundles, the humeroradial ligament, which is visible deep to the supinator tendon. We can try to locate it by playing with the anisotropy, and there is a glimpse of it here. The annular ligament, which wraps around the radial head, is often hard to see. These two ligaments are often injured when the epicondylar tendons are damaged and accompany lesions of the supinator tendon. This leaves the third and final bundle, which is the humeroulnar ligament. It is mainly damaged in cases of elbow dislocation, since varus injuries are much less frequent than valgus ones. But it is not always easy to find. Take a longitudinal section of the arm in pronation and set the probe at the lateral epicondyle. Then turn it clockwise to reveal a linear hypoechoic structure here. Stretched between the humerus and the lateral side of the ulna. Deeper, you can see the radial head. I hope that this video has helped you unlock the secrets of ultrasound imaging of the lateral aspect of the elbow. Thanks for listening.